Hey, welcome to the very hot, very busy, and even very smoky Glendo Reservoir here in Eastern Wyoming. Um, there's wildfires burning in Canada. You might have heard of these. This is the summer of 2023. Uh, this is early July, and the smoke from these fires just started coming into Wyoming last night. Um, so that's fun. The skies are kind of a, a strange, hazy color right now. Beautiful sunrises and sunsets, uh, but not so great if you're trying to breathe. But I'm on one of my favorite lakes in the entire world, one of my favorite places in the world. And it's, like I said, Glendo Reservoir. It's built on the North Platte River. Um, the North Platte, of course, is one of the main arteries for the Mississippi River. So a lot of the sediment that was normally coming from the North Platte is now sequestered behind a variety of dams. There's dams on Alcova, Seminole, Pathfinder, Glendo, um, in Nebraska on Lake McConaughey. There's a whole variety of dams that are uh, designed for agriculture primarily. Um, they're also finding a lot of use as recreation. The result is a lot of the sediment that normally is making its way to the Mississippi is stuck here. It's not really getting through and it's building up some of the reservoirs. So the Mississippi Delta is shrinking. You might have heard of the subsidence in the Delta, sea levels rising. Yes, sea levels rising, but also the Delta is subsiding because there's not a lot of sediment coming in. You can tell just from looking behind me, there's some really interesting rocks here, which is why I'm here. I'm here primarily for fishing, to look at some rocks, to do some boating, fishing, to look at some of the trace fossils in the rocks, to enjoy a respite from the 100 plus degree weather we've been having in Texas for the fishing. So I drove up here a couple of days ago. I've been here about a week actually, as it turns out. Um, and I'm taking off, you know, in a day or two. So I figured might as well do some videos of the geology here. It's pretty spectacular stuff. So this first one, I'm gonna start us at the very base of this section. We have a Paleozoic all the way through a Cenozoic section. It's gonna be kind of fun. We're gonna work away from Mississippi and Pennsylvanian all the way up to the Triassic, from the Triassic all the way into the Jurassic, and from the Jurassic into a little bit of the Cretaceous, and then the Oligocene, Eocene Oligocene. So it should be a pretty fun video. There's gonna be a series of them that I'm putting together. Uh, you're not gonna to wanna to miss them. Stay tuned. If you've been curious about Glendo, if you've been curious about the geology in Wyoming, you might have a good time watching this. You might even learn something. All right, I'm gonna to try to avoid the party boats that are going on out there. A lot of them are blasting really obnoxious music and chock full of really rowdy people. So I'm gonna stay close to the shoreline so I don't get wiped out by one of these yahoos. All right, so first things first, let's talk a little bit about the geological setting. Not too much, don't worry, we're not gonna to get too far into the details. Just to kind of set the stage for where are we in the world. Uh, this reservoir and these uplifts are here because the North Platte River had sliced through an area of uplifted Mesozoic, Paleozoic, um, and of course, Cenozoic rocks. The uplifted area is what's called the Hartville Uplift. The Hartville Uplift is actually uh, somewhat continuous with the Laramie Mountains to the south and the Black Hills in South Dakota. You might've heard of them. Uh, it's where the infamous Sturgis Rally happens every year. Um, Devil's Towers in that area, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the aliens like it, everybody likes it, bikers, people from out of this world, might be one and the same. So the Hartville Uplift is this tectonic feature that's been active for billions of years. It actually goes all the way back to the Archean. And there's evidence for um, uplift of the Hartville Uplift it's at least three or four times going from about 1.7 to 2.1 billion years old, but it didn't stop there. It kept uplifting. So in the Mesozoic, in the late Triassic to early Jurassic, there was another uplift. And in that case, what happened is we lost a whole bunch of rocks. If they were even here to begin with. We don't know if they were here. They might have been, um, there might have been a low mountain range here where the rocks never accumulated, the sediments never accumulated. We just don't know. But we have a gap between the early Triassic and the early Jurassic. We're missing several tens of millions of years. So the Jurassic Sundance Formation sits directly on top of what's called the Goose Egg Formation. That's that reddish shale and sand and um, carbonate. 
and even some gypsum behind me. And there's also another unconformity in the Jurassic between middle to late Jurassic um, Sundance formation and the Morrison formation. We're going to take a look at that. We're going to lay hands on that unconformity. It's subtle. It takes some looking at it. It really takes some investigation of the trace fossils, the sedimentology, very detailed work to be able to pick it out. And in fact, some people have even argued it's not there because they haven't looked at the full data set. Fortunately, I have, and I'm going to take you along with me. There's another unconformity between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Now, that's part of a regional unconformity, and I should mention so is that Jurassic unconformity. These aren't just local unconformities, but they're accentuated by the uplift of the Hartville. Then finally, there's an Eocene to Oligocene unconformity. And I'm going to show you the White River Formation, which outcrops all around Glendo, and it sits unconformably on Pennsylvanian Permian, Triassic, and even Jurassic and Cretaceous rocks, depending on how the land was tilted when that stuff got accumulated. So we're going to look at all that stuff. So it's all here because sediment was building out onto variously tilted and uplifted and eroding landscapes that were a function of the Hartville uplift moving from about 2 billion years all the way up through at least the Oligocene. Let's go look at some rocks. I've talked enough. I promise I'll show you some really cool things. Let's go. Oh boy. Increasingly, people are using apps on their phone. I use them, you use them, everybody uses them. Um, there's a couple of great geological apps out there for mapping. One is called Rock D. I never figured out how that's pronounced. The other is something like Macrostrat, which uses, uses Rock D. Um, they're good for surficial mapping. They're not so good for outcrops like the one behind me. Behind me is the Hartville Formation. So that's maybe a Mississippian up into Pennsylvanian. So a Carboniferous unit that on the map, take a look at this. That's right, it doesn't show up. It shows as Quaternary Alluvium. And that's because those maps are based on the surface. They're not based on the outcrop. So if you look at the map, you're looking at the surface. And sure enough, capping those cliffs over there is Quaternary Alluvium. The outcrop itself is Mississippian Pennsylvanian. So you got to be careful. You know, apps are really handy, but sometimes you have to just go back to the good old-fashioned papers, books, um, and research to avoid making mistakes like trying to identify something based only on a digital map that might not be accurate. With that said, let's go take a look at these. Here we are at the base of the section at Glendo. The North Platte River is running right through here from north to south. It comes into the reservoir behind me to the north. It flows to the south. These rocks here behind me are the Hartville Formation. This is that Mississippian to Pennsylvanian. Might be Mississippian. The dates aren't that great on it. Uh, red beds, dolomites, cherts, sandstone, siltstones, the works. As we go down to the south, we're going to be going up section. So that means these rocks have been tilted to the south. Because the rocks are tilted to the south, what was originally horizontal is now going this way. So we're actually going from bottom to top as we head in that direction. So let's take a look at these guys. I'll cruise along because really there's not too many places to stop. But I'll point out some interesting features as we go. All right. The first thing you notice is the color. And there's obviously some really white material and there's some red cross bedded material. Um, you can see laminations in the red. That red is actually sandstone and some silt. And the lighter color material is carbonates. And it's either carbonates or in some cases might even be evaporites. So there's a mixed kind of carbonate clastic environment happening here in the Mississippi and Pennsylvania. And that's typical of an environment where you've got um, aeolian sands, meaning windblown sands, blowing into a shallow warm water platform. And you see things like this right now off the coast of Saudi Arabia in the Red Sea. Um, anywhere you have a tropical environment with arid land blowing sand into a carbonate shelf. And that seems to be what was happening here in Wyoming in the Mississippi into Pennsylvania. You can really see some of the cross bedding in the sandstone there. Um, it really jumps out at you. It indicates a direction of transport largely to the south and southeast. You also notice there's a lot of deformation in these rocks. They are really screwed up and through the ringer, and it looks like there's all kinds of breccia pipes pushed through them. Um, there's a variety of reasons that might be. Typically, it's because there's some sort of mobilization of the sediment. 
and looking at them, they actually look like they have filled into fissures. So they might have been something that's been moving uh, from the top down. So this is the transition from the Hartville Formation below to the Red Goose Egg Formation above. And there's a change in lithology too. So you notice the goose egg is kind of this uh, soil forming, very silty, sandy, muddy material compared to the carbonates and sands of the Hartville. I'm in a little cove on the eastern side of the reservoir now. This is all around me, that red bed material and some of the lighter color material of the goose egg formation. Probably named because there's a lot of Canada geese here that lay a lot of eggs on the shoreline. So probably whoever found this said, oh boy, what are we gonna call it? Goose egg. I don't know, I'm making that up. There's probably a good reason I haven't looked at it. You know, one of the interesting things about the goose egg formation is this really rich, deep brick red iron oxide color, which is from the hematite. It's uh, a mineral that people around the world have used to create a color called ochre. Uh, some of the oldest art in the world uses ochre in cave paintings. People were buried with ochre coloration. And in fact, one of the oldest mines in the world is a 13,000 to about 12,000 year old mine, not far from here in Wyoming, where ochre was mined. There's also Clovis points associated with this. Some of the first people in North America, uh, some of the first Americans were using the goose egg formation as a source of coloration. You didn't think we'd be able to get through this without talking about some neo -ecology. Up on the cliff here are dozens of little cliff swallows. They're these little birds that make mud nests. They collect mud from around the lakeshore and create these intricate little cup-shaped, bowl-shaped nests with a small entry hole. And they come in, feed the chicks that they raise in there, fly out, everybody poops outside. It's a pretty good system. Uh, unfortunately, every so often a chick does fall out. And if you're in a lake where there's fish like bass and they're in here, or walleye, and they're in here, uh, they might be able to eat that chick. So it's a little bit sad, but most of them hang in, and obviously they're doing A-OK -okay here. So cliff swallows, they're great, great natural insect control. They eat tons of mosquitoes. I uh, forget how many tons an individual bird can eat, but it's like a ridiculous amount uh, given the nesting season. Cool, huh? Oh boy. That's the Jurassic. So we've come up from the early Triassic. We're missing a big chunk of time. And now we're in the early Jurassic Sundance Formation. I actually did a video on this very outcrop last year. It was one of the first videos I made talking about whether it's a tidal bar or a tidal dune. Um, you can see some big forsets in that body. It's a sand that sits on top of aeolian deposits. So the earliest Jurassic deposit here is actually Middle Jurassic, it's not Early Jurassic. I just mean the first Jurassic deposit here is windblown sand, like a desert. Then, on top of that, is these tidal dunes. And these tidal dunes are part of a, that initial transgression of the Western Interior Seaway. So this is a very sandy system, and as it got younger, it got progressively deeper. So we're at tidal here. The next stop I'm going to show you is really different, and it's the next member up in the Sundance Formation. This is the marine part of the Sundance Formation. It has a very early, early Aeolian part and that's called the Canyon Springs member. But we're in a part now that's marine. And we know it's marine because look at this. Some really nice ripples, linear ripples. Again, they can form in lakes, rivers, reservoirs, oceans, bays, seas. Ripples aren't very diagnostic. But there's some other really exciting things I wanna show you here besides these gorgeous ripples. And again, this is a state park. Don't collect anything. Take all the pictures you want. Do not collect anything. I warn you. These are some absolutely spectacular rhizocorallium traces. They're made probably by polychaete worms, and it's a little bit hard to see what's happening, so let me walk you through it. Um, this is a really nice one here. There's a tube that makes a big U-shape, and the animal creates a U-shaped burrow that comes down from the sediment surface above, burrows down horizontally, and creates a U. But it doesn't stop there. It creates a U, like this one you can see. It's actually a composite of many different U's. So it creates a U and then another U and another U and another U and another U, on and on, and what's called Sprita. So we know this was the last U because it cuts through all of these. This block is chock full of Rhizocorallium. All right, we are cruising along now south 
in what's called the Narrows. It's called the Narrows because the lake gets very narrow here because the Platte River is cutting through these Jurassic sand bodies. There's a lot of sand in the Sundance Formation here. In other parts of the Sundance, in Wyoming, and its equivalents up in Montana, there's a lot of shale and even carbonate because the source of the sand was to the east and to the south. Probably the Appalachians and probably also down in Oklahoma. So we've got a whole lot of sand coming into what would have been shallow marine environments here on the Sundance Seaway. It got deeper to the west, it got deeper to the north, but here we're still pretty shallow. Um, not quite beaches at this point, uh, but if they were here, they got transgressed. This part of the Sundance, remember I mentioned there was a couple of members, the really massive looking one is called the LAC, L-A-K. Um, there's not a lot going on in terms of trace fossils or sedimentary structures, so we're not gonna bother looking at it. It's a mystery, there's all kinds of arguments about what environment it formed in. Long story short, nobody really knows. The Pine Butte on top of it is another story, and that's pretty interesting. So we're gonna zip into this cove, gonna go up section and look through it because it's pretty damn cool stuff. We're younger than we were. Oh, I'm sliding down the hill. That's always fun, especially when the hill is a vertical drop. I'll be careful. I'm wearing very good footwear. Where was I? Here, something happened in the lac. Who knows what? But by the Pine Butte time, things have changed. We're in a very strongly tidal system. Could be a tidal delta, tidal flats on an open tidal coast. Don't know that, but it's a very, very low energy tidal system with ripples. We don't see hummocks. We see regular bedding. We don't see a lot of disturbed bedding. It's not 100% bioturbated. And there's little delicate diplocriterians, ophiomorphs, and things like that that like estuarine tidal flats, estuarine tidal bars, stuff like that. So we've changed from when we first started, which was lacustrine um, into maybe a soil in the Permian to uh, Triassic. And then something happened with the Hartville uplift. Then we started flooding the basin with the seaway. Big open angry ocean with big waves, lots of sediments spilling in, slowing down at times to the rise of Corellium to have their way with it, and then storms washing more in. And as we move forward in time, that basin started filling with sediment, and here we are on tidal flats. I'm gonna summarize from a safer location, or maybe I'll just do it right here. Because from here, we're gonna continue on up. Something is about to change, and I think you'll be surprised. So as I'm cruising along just opposite Reno Cove, uh, if you're familiar with the lake, I'll put it on the map. Notice how the Pine Butte has that thick sand body on top of it, and it looks pretty massive. Well, it turns out it's not massive at all. It's pretty cross-bedded and heavily bioturbated by Thalassinoides and Smophiomorpha. So that's pretty good indication that it's a mouth bar or some other shallow marine sand sitting on top of the tidal bar, tidal delta, tidal flats of the lower part of the Pine Butte. So we've shallowed up. It's a lot higher energy. There's a lot less of that heterolithic deposit and there's a lot more big burrows. Last up on our tour of the Jurassic Marine, is this cliff behind me, the dark gray material below the golden sand is the red water shale member of the Sundance. It's an open marine unit. Again, there's really big thalassinoides, really big rhizocorralliums, and storm deposits down at the base, which unfortunately we can't get to because the water's a little high right now. But beautiful hummocks and swales, uh, Bellumnite hash. I found some really nice big ammonites called Cardioceros. But you notice this color change. It goes from gray to sort of a reddish and then to a green. Something's happening geochemically and that's associated with an unconformity. Again, with the unconformity, probably related to the Hartville uplift moving or possibly related to uh, climate change in the Jurassic. As climate gets colder, water tends to contract. Uh, you get thermal expansion and compression, and it causes sea level to fall. Now, we know there's a lot of tectonic activity in the Rocky Mountains and the Jurassic, so my money's probably going to be on that. But the golden material above is the basal part of the Morris Information called the Windy Hill. And the Windy Hill is well known for footprints from dinosaurs and pterosaurs. There's a whole ichnofauna in and it looks from here like there's three stacked bodies, which 
are capped by soils that include dinosaur footprints. So these things are probably tidal flats. They're going from distal to proximal, then transgressing and distal to proximal and transgressing three in a row. So one thing that's unique about the redwater shale here, or at least I haven't seen it in too many other places, is objects like this. Um, these are septarian nodules. Let me get it so the light's actually shining on it. Wow, what an improvement. Uh, these form in the sediment in the subsurface when water carrying minerals percolates in and starts to accumulate and cause fracturing of the sediment. So it starts to kind of expand, build a concretion, and that fractioning, uh, the fracturing starts filling in with these minerals and you create this funky pattern. So these are pretty common all throughout here in the redwater shale. There's something about the chemistry of it. And again, state park, leave it. So I'm gonna do just that. It stays here. All right, well, if we were wondering what kind of an environment this is, where are these ripples forming? These are little bits of shell. Um, they're pretty thick looking bits of shell. They're rounded. So they're rounded little water-worn abraded bits of probably marine shell. Um, and you can see there's some of the original coloring to it, uh, the mother of pearl look to it. Now in a marine system where the shells get busted up and kind of washed around and polished, this type of preservation is very common. So you combine these shell fragments that indicate they've been washing back and forth, back and forth, getting rounded, with our ripples that have flat crests, we're starting to have a picture emerge of a very tidal system, or a system at least that's gently, because um, we remember those ripples are not very strongly unidirectional, so maybe gently kind of washing back and forth in a tidal environment where shell fragments get accumulated and worn. So I'm checking out some more slump blocks from that Golden Windy Hill member, and this material looks a lot like soil formation. So we've got kind of the greens, we've got sort of the reds, it's kind of cracked. That's typical of something that's been severely exposed. So there might have been a soil forming here. And if you want further indication of that, I found this, which is a dinosaur track. One toe, two toe, three toes. There's the heel. I actually found this several years ago, and it's really, it's kind of alarming how it's eroding. It used to be in a full block, and it looks like most of the block is falling apart around it, so this thing's going to be exposed pretty soon. But it's a three-toed dinosaur track going that direction. Here's another dinosaur track. Seems to have three toes. One, two, three. And it's going that direction. Now, again, this is a block that's fallen down. But you can see, you know, it's about the same size. So that one is about the same size as that one, maybe a little bit smaller. So we have three-toed dinosaurs running around in the Mars information. Oh my goodness, look at that. That's a big natural cast of a dinosaur track. So the mud that was in there is eroded and left behind the sand that got pushed down when the animal walked. And there's another one back there. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of them along this layer. So there's a bunch of dinosaur tracks in our basal Mars information. Now remember, the shale below, the dark shale is marine. We know that because there's ammonites in there. There's belemnites, there's all sorts of marine organisms. And then there's dinosaurs stomping around on tidal flats. Something's missing. We're missing a shoreline succession, a shore face, any sort of progradational delta. It goes from offshore mud to onshore tidal flats with dinosaurs. Because there's an unconformity at the base, probably associated with, as I mentioned before, the Hartville uplift or some sort of sea level change. So this is the basal Mars information. We've just got a couple more things to look at and then we've seen the full succession at Glendale. Here's a nice clean face of that Mars information, what's called the brushy basin member. There's names for everything. But you can see it's got kind of a maroon color to it along with some green. And the green, if you saw the videos I did in Moab, you know that's usually associated with lacustrine environments, uh, lakes, little ephemeral lakes or ponds. The red is oxidized, probably soils, probably paleosols. So here's the Morris information. On the very top of the cliff is the Dakota sandstone. That's Cretaceous. And there's an unconformity between the Morris and the Dakota. So there's an unconformity between the Morris and the Sundance, an unconformity between the Morris and the Dakota. And then, of course, back there, there's the unconformity putting the Oligocene White River formation on top of everything. Next up, we'll take a final stop at the White River formation and see what it's all about. 
and then you'll have seen the whole shebang here at Glendo Reservoir. Incidentally, the marina is right behind me. So you can launch right there. You can come rent a boat, launch, and do this whole thing for yourself. It's totally worthwhile. Get a geological map. Don't trust apps. All right, let's make our final pit stop at the Eocene, and that'll be a day. And here we are at the very last of the sedimentary deposits at Glendo Reservoir, aside from the Quaternary Alluvium on top. Nobody really cares about that. This is the White River Formation. It's really, really well known for its well-preserved fossil mammals, tortoises, all kinds of vertebrates. Um, there's also a lot of trace fossils in it. Not this outcrop, this is pretty nasty looking stuff. In other outcrops in the area, there's fluvial channel deposits, gravel, sand. Here, it's all this very light colored tuff. So it's volcanic ash that's been rained out probably by the Absorga volcanoes um, around about 30 million years ago. It's really creamy stuff. It turns into cream cheese when you chew it. It looks like solid rock, but it's ash. Now, of course, bentonite, volcanic ash, uh, has a lot of uses and a lot of industrial applications. And it's because it creates such a nice um, creamy consistency when it's introduced to water and pulverized. It also makes driving a real nightmare. If you're driving on a road made out of this stuff, it's like trying to drive through cream cheese. It's, it's a lousy experience, and I don't recommend it. So the White River Formation here sits unconformably on top of all the older material, including the Goose Egg Formation. Incidentally, I'm standing on Goose Island in Glendo Reservoir. So this island is where the geese like to make their nests and breed. Um, the Goose Egg outcrops on the mainland. Goose Island is made up of the White River Formation. It all gets kind of confusing. I hope you enjoyed this overview of Glendo Reservoir and the sedimentology and the geology of the locality. There's going to be some more videos coming up in a little bit more detail on some of these outcrops. So I hope you'll tune in. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And remember, get outside, look at some rocks, make friends with them. You'll be glad you did.